It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Last week, the U.S. Labor Department announced that the unemployment rate dropped to 3.9 percent. This is the lowest unemployment rate since 2001. Some economists predicted that it will continue to drop and reach 3.5 five percent by the end of this year. Now, President Trump has been celebrating the news, of course. In a recent tweet, he wrote, jobs, jobs, jobs. Unemployment claims have dropped to a 45-year low. Together, we are making the economy great again. However, one issue has puzzled many economists, which is why wages are not rising faster than inflation. Economic theory normally says that when unemployment is low, wages go up because there is more competition to attract workers. However, both wages and inflation remain quite low at the moment. Now, President Trump himself offered an explanation six years ago to this issue before uh, he was president, when he was still a bus businessman. He said, Unemployment rate only dropped because more people are out of the labor force and have stopped looking for work. Not a real recovery, he wrote, phony numbers. So what is happening now? Why are wages stagnant while unemployment is uh, reaching historic lows. Joining me now to explain all of this is Bob Poland. Bob is a distinguished professor of economics and he is the co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He's the author of many books relevant to this discussion is the book Back to Full Employment. Good to have you with us, Bob. Great to be on. Thank you, Sharmini. Bob, let's take up what the economists are saying about what's happening, the apparent contradiction between low unemployment and the stagnant wages. Uh, now, if we were to take Trump's own explanation, he says that these numbers are phony, that the economy is not in recovery. People have just stopped looking for work. What do you make of that explanation? Well, it's always been true that the that the headline unemployment number that we hear, the one that you just quoted, 3.9% at present, does not fully capture the distress people feel in the labor market. That was true when Trump made his comment six years ago. It was true when he was a candidate. He was saying, you know, the actual unemployment rate is maybe closer to 40%, not 5%. Um, so here are the issues. Uh, the official rate, this 3.9%, uh, first of all, does not take account of people that are working part-time and want to work full-time. So if you have a job that pay, that's for five hours a week, but you want a 40-hour-a-week job, you are not counted as unemployed. But the D Labor Department does have another category uh, that includes people that are underemployed, and people that have dropped out of the labor force temporarily because they don't see good prospects for themselves. If you go to that number instead of the official number, the official rate by the U.S. Labor Department today is actually 7.8%, not 3.9%. If we include people that are taking jobs at uh, just a few hours a week, less than a, a full week, and people that are uh, uh, dropped out because they uh, temporarily are, feel distressed. Now, on top of that, if you include what Trump was referring to uh, six years ago, which is the people, the, the total participation of the adult uh, population in the labor force, that has gone down by a lot uh, relative to right before the Great Recession, a decade ago. If you said that the participation rate should be the same as it was 10 years ago, well, now we're up to about a 12% unemployment rate. So that's, uh, you know, you can go from 3.9%, the official rate, all the way up to something like 12%. If you include uh, the low participation rate, 
the people that we call underemployed and the people that are discouraged. All right. Um, now, another explanation, Bob, comes from Paul Krugman, uh, who says that employers are simply more reluctant to raise wages than they used to. Instead, they are relying on one-time signing bonuses to attract them. Now, um, we are getting away from the actual numbers here. We're talking about wages. But what do you make of that explanation for wages? Well, first of all, let's say the Wall Street Journal yesterday had an article saying that wages aren't going up. So this is the Wall Street Journal acknowledging the reality that despite uh, this, at least according to the official statistics, the lowest unemployment rate in decades, we still are not seeing wages going up. Now, uh, of course, it's always the case business owners don't ever want to give wage increases. So the fact that if Krugman is saying, well, you know, they're reluctant. Well, they're always reluctant. They want to keep money in their own pockets, not give money to workers. And the thing that drives up wages is therefore workers' bargaining power. That's the key now. That's the key always. And the, the fact is that what we have observed, not just now, but what we've observed at this point for almost uh, 50 years, uh, since 1972, the average wage for a non-supervisory worker today is lower than it was in 1972, 46 years ago. And so it's not just a current phenomenon that Krugman is referring to or something re re reflecting the sentiments of business owners, capitalists. Um, what it is, is that workers' bargaining power uh, has been attacked for you know two generations now. Uh, this is the this is the heart and soul of neoliberalism, and the 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 uh, dynamic of it was explained extremely clearly and straightforwardly by none other than Alan Greenspan, who was the chair of the Federal Reserve for 17 years, the longest serving chair of the Federal Reserve, in the middle of his tenure. Back in the late 1990s, the last time unemployment was down this low, official unemployment went below 4%. Wage uh, inflation wasn't going up then either. And uh, so Greenspan had an explanation. He was very straightforward. He said it's traumatized workers. That was his term. The workers are traumatized. Well, what does that mean? He said, well, that workers see that businesses have other options. And they are therefore, the workers are therefore reluctant to push for higher wages, even at low unemployment rate. They're, they're reluctant because the business owners will say, oh, you want a wage increase? Oh, fine. Well, we'll, uh, we'll relocate to Mexico or we'll just start importing from China. And so as a result of that, workers' bargaining power, even at relatively low unemployment rates, has been weak. On top of that, the institutional forces supporting workers bargaining power, uh, mainly unions, has also have been attacked. Uh, this is also a cornerstone of neoliberalism. So what we have is this long-term trajectory of even at low unemployment, workers do not have the bargaining power that they used to have. Uh, this has not been fully recognized in mainstream economics even now, even almost 50 years after the phenomenon uh, emerged in reality. All right, uh, Bob, I should add to that that Bernie Sanders uh, just a few days ago introduced uh, a Senate bill protecting uh, employees' uh, rights in terms of uh, EFCA, uh, the employee protections to organize in the workplace. And this is a bill that had been outstanding throughout Obama's period where he promised to pass it that never got through and Bernie Sanders has reintroduced it in an effort to address exactly what you were just talking about. Right. So let's move on. What about the relationship, Bob, between productivity and wages? Until the 1970s, there was a very direct relationship between the two. However, since then, the relationship has broken. In other words, even though productivity is increasing, wages are not regardless of the unemployment rate. Why is that happening? It's the same explanation. So what we see is that 
since 1972 again, wages have basically been stagnant. Average worker productivity, meaning the amount the average worker produces in the course of the day, from an average day with the average level of machinery behind them, the average worker produces about twice as much as she or he did in 1972. So if the average wage is stagnant and average productivity has doubled, that means the income is rising to the top. So you want an explanation for the rise of inequality in this country. Uh, that is the first and foremost explanation, just in logical statistical terms. If you're producing twice as much and the workers, the average workers, are getting paid exactly the same, then the rest of that increased product is going to people other than the workers. And that's what explains uh, more than anything else uh, um, income inequality and wealth inequality. And again, why is why aren't wages going up relative to productivity? Well, you know, uh, standard economic theory said, yes, wage increases should rise with productivity. In fact, Krug, Paul Krugman himself, way back 25 years ago, said this is, you know, this is then all throughout history. It was always the case that wages rise when productivity rises. Well, it's just not true. It's just not true. It hasn't been true for almost 50 years in this country. And the reason, again, is that the bargaining power of workers has been assaulted by neoliberalism. In fact, if you want to name one thing that defines neoliberalism, this is exactly it, that you run an economy in which the benefits of productivity growth accrue to the rich and everybody else faces stagnating incomes and opportunities. Now, this is rather counterproductive for uh, the capitalists itself and neoliberals because less money there is in the hands of workers, the less they will be able to purchase and to stimulate the economy. Um, your comments on that? So the alternative path to stimulating the economy and generating profitability ha under neoliberalism has been to explode the financial sector. And so what we have seen, again, throughout neoliberalism, and in particular over the last couple of decades, has been uh, the extraction of profits through finance, using the financial system as a way through which we can pull profits out. Now, it is true, as you just said, Charmini, that underlying everything, even if you, no matter how fancy you make your financial system, how complex, uh, in the very end, you need people to buy products. You need people to buy products. And the fact is that, you know, the U.S. economy, Western Europe, they've, the growth trajectory has been stagnant, again, over roughly this same period. Even on, you know, right now we are in the longest recovery in uh, you know the last hundred years in this economy, but the growth rate of GDP uh, has still been modest, you know, uh, in the range of two percent, which is way below the growth trajectory for the fifty years up to uh, the 1980 was really about 3.3 percent. So we're way down in terms of growth, and the underlying uh, pressures are not there because we do not have enough. Uh, well-being spread out so that people have money to buy things. That's the nature of the economy that we operate under. This is, yes, this is the essence of neoliberalism. All right, Bob, I thank you so much for joining us today, and I'm sure we're going to have another opportunity to talk about this when the summer numbers come out, when the students and temporary workers, summer workers join the workforce, I'm sure we will be presented with another positive uh, report where it says that the unemployment numbers have hit another low. But we'll save the conversation for then. I thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thank you. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.